This is a Land Rover Discovery 2, and these are very appealing four-wheel drives. They look fantastic, super comfortable, infinitely customizable, and they'll go just about everywhere, but let's be honest here, they are a Land Rover from the early 2000s, which are not known for their longevity. But Charles, how you doing, buddy? Hey, doing well, how are you? Charles has found a way to make this Land Rover into something really special and perhaps far more reliable than the original model that came out of the showroom in 04. So Charles, what drew you to the Discovery in the first place? Uh, well, to be honest, it was watching your series <laughs> on the Discovery 2. Uh, kind of put me on the, the radar of them because uh, I love the style of the late 90s, early 2000s uh, SUVs looking for a fun off-road kind of Discovery vehicle out here. Um, and saw this and was really impressed with the off-road capabilities. It's hard to find solid front axle vehicles that drive well, that look good, have a nice interior. Really good combination. Now, so the kind of the hard thing about Discovery 2s, and we'll start at the beginning of the story, is that they're very hard vehicles to find because they are um, not particularly well made. So people kind of just let them fall apart and then they fall into this just pit of despair where they never emerge from. But this one is beautiful. So did it look like this when you bought it? Was it stock? How did you find this vehicle? Yeah, it's totally stock. Uh, it's a Colorado vehicle uh, throughout its whole life. Uh, had 140,000 miles when I got it, uh, but had been put maybe a couple thousand over the last five years. Uh, so it was up in the mountains in Colorado and somebody just used it for weekend vehicles. So I get the sense that it was your classic uh, mall crawler type vehicle for somebody to drive around in. Uh, and luckily did not do any modifications or any bad things to it and kept it pretty well maintained. Yeah, I mean, it's gorgeous. The paint yeah. is beautiful, it's super straight. And I think you're right, like if you're looking to buy one of these, in a lot of ways, you're better off finding a stock one yeah. that you know hasn't been messed with or wheeled too hard. Yeah. And then you yeah. can be the one to mess with it and wheel it hard. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so you found this and you said it was a running, driving uh, Discovery in, in pretty good shape, it looks like. Yeah, I got really lucky. The, the well, because it's a Land Rover Discovery 2, the head gaskets were replaced around 80,000 miles. Uh, but I ran an engine oil analysis on it and it was actually running well. Um, so everything other than that, no of the three Amigos wasn't on, um, no other major problems to it. It's a really solid starting point. So you had the stock disco and then what was the first step toward turning it into the beast we see today? What did you start out by modifying it? Uh, the first was just a suspension. Okay. Uh, so gutted everything underneath it. Uh, so four inch terra firma lift. Uh, on here, uh, have 32, 33 inch uh, ridge grapplers on there, replace all the bushings, uh, all the different elements, detachable sway bar uh, in there, some of the protection, uh, and then swapped out the gears to 437s Whoa. with uh, ARB lockers front and rear. Um, took it out to Moab and it was perfect. It just crawled over everything uh, in there, especially when you lock the center, uh, it's just, can't be stopped, it's really fun. Wow, so, I mean, it, it looks very clean, but underneath it's had a lot of work if we're talking air lockers. And, and are you happy with this tire setup? Was this kind of the size you were looking for? Yeah, I think so. People will fit 35s uh, on them, but for me, it's already tall enough. Uh, it really doesn't need to be taller. And for the level of off-road uh, wheeling that I do, I don't really need that much more. This size tire kind of keeps me from getting into anything too aggressive. and. I like to remind people this is the size that comes on a Wrangler Rubicon, uh, so it's not a small tire by any means. No way. So you bought this vehicle, I think you said for 8,500, right? Correct, And yeah. then you had done all the modifications and you were loving life. Um, and then what was the turning point where the, the Land Rover bugs started to come in and, and, and wreak their havoc? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I enjoy working on cars being with. I'm not a professional mechanic, but I always enjoy kind of working and learning on things. So when I bought it, I knew that the motor was not long for the world, that it was eventually going to have a problem. Uh, so I kind of planned an LS swap uh, hmm. in the winter after off-roading season uh, was done, but uh, it stranded me a couple of times with some electrical gremlins uh, in it. And the wife was not keen on the idea of taking road trips or going anywhere else with a vehicle that could just <laughs> strand us randomly uh, on it. And so that's when the decision was made to pull forward and just go ahead and swap the uh, 
obvious solution in, which is a LS. So do you mind popping the hood and we'll take yeah, a look? Yeah, for sure. So for a little bit of background information, um, the Discovery 2 used a variant of what they called the Rover V8, which was this ancient Buick V8 that they used all the way up through 04, um, but it was all aluminum and they had major head gasket issues. And then they also had uh, liners that would tend to slip. Um, and when that happened, you basically fried your engine. Um, and unfortunately, like the head gaskets, they weren't an if they were gonna fail, it was a when. Yeah. And unless you're yeah. like a, a good technician like Charles, you're, you're gonna pay out pay out a lot to yeah. get those fixed. And they can even be fixed poorly. If they really get overheated and the uh, heads get distorted on them and you don't send them to a machine shop, then it is frequent to see the Carfax with head gaskets at 80,000 miles, <laughs> head gaskets at 90,000 miles. Um, so yeah, they're, they're troublesome to keep on the road. And I know that someone's gonna fight me in the comment section about this, but it's pretty much universally agreed that the 4.6 V8 in the Land Rovers just wasn't a very long-lived engine, yeah. right? That is basically what gave these vehicles such a bad reputation for longevity. Um, so you had a choice, right? You could have probably dove into those electrical gremlins yeah. and try to make that 4.6 uh, stronger, and there are ways you could upgrade them. Um, but what was kind of the turning point that you said, ah, I'm just gonna go GM power on this? Uh, you know, I'm not that super skilled of a mechanic. Well, uh, okay, and, hang on. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm like, not, in like, <laughs> not in like I'm gonna go buy a like super random V8 and, and slap it in or some crazy turbo conversion or something. Um, the LS motor gets swapped into everything because it's so easy. Hmm. Uh, I mean, people make fun of the swap as being predictable, but it's just, it's incredibly easy. Well, we, uh, we say easy, but I think the story will <laughs> maybe, maybe pan out a little differently. So you wanted an LS. Um, how do you go about finding these V8s? Where did you find this one? Yeah, so it's a little bit tricky to find them uh, if you want the transmission, because I have the, the six-speed transmission with it. Uh, and you want to keep them paired because the computers need to uh, be synchronized with them. So this one actually came off of eBay. There's uh, resellers that have junkyards that can get a little bit more from them by uh, selling them on eBay. So bought it on like a Wednesday and the following Monday it was sitting in my garage uh, <laughs> with it and started the process of uh, doing mild refresh on them. Uh, in this generation they had displacement on demand uh, and the VVT which is the unreliable aspects of the the 5.3 so put a mild cam in there to get rid of that and then cleaned up gaskets and seals and other common failure points and um, should be good to go another 100,000 miles at least. And what's the engine out of? What's kind of the make in the model? Uh, 2011 Chev uh, Chevy Silverado 1500. Okay. Uh, so just kind of that size of a truck. So it's a 5.3 liter uh, motor, which is more than enough for me. I mean, I know a lot of people will want the, the six liters or, you know, LS3 or something, but, you know, this thing is never going to be fast. Uh, <laughs> it's just by nature of the gearing and the size. So the 5.3 is a nice, somewhat more affordable option to a 6.0. So you think somewhere around, what, 330 horsepower? Yeah, yeah, really good. So it's uh, from the factory, I think they rate them at 300 uh, horsepower and 330 uh, oh, okay. pound-feet of torque. Uh, with the cam, it probably would bump that up a little bit. It's a truck cam, so mostly torque. Yeah. Uh, but as you know, here at altitude, right. you know, it sucks a bunch of that away and then this four-wheel drive drivetrain sucks a lot more out of it, so. So I think from the factory though, it had 217 or something. It was like just About over- 200 horsepower, yeah, 300 200. torque. So yeah. it was, it was. I mean, that's a pretty significant bump. So what can people expect to pay just for the engine and transmission combo if they want to go like the route you did? What, what do they typically run? <laughs> yeah, I think around five grand is, is probably okay. a good mark. The one thing to pay attention to if you're looking for them is the latest generation, the LT. You can find really uh, a lot less but it's not an LS motor anymore, so all the oh. accessories won't fit on mm -hmm. those. So they're starting to sell cheap and people are making kits for them, but uh, I think the Gen 4 is really the sweet spot of uh, new enough that they're reliable, but also massive aftermarket parts availability. So you yank the 4.6 out, you've mm -hmm. got this you know, new shiny engine. Talk to me through the process of I mean, obviously, it's not just going to bolt in. Who, who's doing the conversion kits? How does that process work? Yeah, you know, there's a surprising number of conversion kits available for these. The, the hardware kit uh, with the transfer case uh, converter came out of Australia with Mark's four-wheel drive uh, for it. Uh, you know, engine harness is a new harness from PSI conversion. Uh, and then there's a company out of San Diego uh, called RW Engineering, and he makes a, a CAN bus gateway to talk 
from the rover computers to the GM computers uh, to make all of that work together. And then beyond that, it's just a lot of uh, internet searching to find the right brackets for the AC and for the power steering and alternators and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I mean, lots and lots of steps in it, uh, but worth so, it in the end, I think. So when I see this, I look at it and I'm like, oh, it's a, it looks like it fits super cleanly and it looks like it was built to be there. From like a, a, a fitment standpoint, was it pretty simple to slide it and get it all connected to the transfer case just from like the bare bones getting this to fit? Yeah, okay. yeah, it wasn't too bad. I think the scariest thing was we had the whole thing put together, including the transfer case uh, on there. So swinging 750, 800 pounds, around to get it in there was tricky but uh <laughs> apart from that it, it goes in really well it fits well uh the ls motor is pretty compact um and uh, the only thing is is a little bit tight with a radiator to uh engine spacing so i have to kind of be be cognizant of that so you see kind of the pipes uh being pulled back just to keep them out of the the belts but uh yeah i mean mechanically it really wasn't the most challenging uh, fit with uh, the kits that come along with it if you uh, have a good degree of kind of mechanical familiarity. Okay, Charles, so in my mind, you got this thing bolted in and then it was just like one connector into the other, fired up, right? Yeah, I mean, basically, that's yeah, it. Basically. You, you, you know it now. <laughs> um, no, honestly, the, the electrical is the hardest part on these things. There's a lot of little things you have to tap into all over the vehicle. Uh, and then the wiring diagrams uh, were never created with the intent of swapping. They were created with the intent of diagnosing. And so trying to chase down every little thing uh, and being obsessive like I am and trying to reuse as much of the standard fuse box <laughs> and everything as possible uh, meant a lot of long nights with uh, chasing wires down, testing wires, figuring out that things are backwards from where they should be because it's a Land Rover. Um, but eventually it's, it's there, just a lot of persistence. So how many, I don't know, hours is kind of a small number, yeah. but how many weekends do you think you have into the, the swap? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was just talking to my buddy about this and he was complaining about how I disappeared into a rabbit hole for about three months <laughs> on this. I uh, originally budgeted probably about seven full days of, of work is what I expected, but I've probably got closer to 15 or 20 full days okay. in there just because so many little things crop up that uh, you know, get you stuck and you have to spend a bunch of time troubleshooting and sorting it out. And then when you do the conversion, like is, is the dash freaked out? Is it like, oh my God, there's, there's transmissions missing and all of this? No, no, I mean, so right now there still is one more uh, wire that we need to track down and uh, feed into it just to let the rover know that it's okay without the, the Land Rover transmission. Uh, but apart from that, all the gauges work, all the other stuff, that's the RW engineering CAN bus is what allows us to connect all those things so it's yeah if you if we can get those uh transmission lights off you would not notice anything right so well, i think the original had like the control module for the trans underneath one of the seats um so i mean is there like computers that are hidden throughout the vehicle that that were tied to this engine <laughs> yeah so i mean the main ones are the engine control module they have a body control module they have an automatic transmission control module and then they have a fun little thing called an IDM, which is for the gauges and other little electrical okay. components. And that's the one that's freaking out right now because it doesn't get a signal that the transmission's okay. Okay. Well, that, I mean, it's, it's super cool that you went ahead and did the swap. So now like the big question I think everyone wants to know, um, do you think you're like under 30 grand into this when it was all said and done? Uh, it depends if my wife's asking or if uh, <laughs> you know, I'm being honest uh, about it. No, so I think for, uh, everything all in with the vehicle purchase, uh, I'm at probably about 40, 42 okay. on it. That's probably 12 grand in suspension. Right. Uh, Cause I gutted everything, gears, lockers, bushings, all of that. Uh, and then the engine swap itself is probably another 10 or 12 on which, it. Which, I mean, when you think about like the world of Discovery Tooth, it sounds like a lot, but when you consider that basically you have what is a very serviceable long-lived powertrain yeah i mean you're still well under the price of a new discovery well i mean think well about it the price. relative to a wrangler too right yeah, if i bought a true. 2010 wrangler <laughs> i put the money into it after five years i'm going to lose as much on that as i lose on this uh and at least this will have a little bit of a uh you know fun in it as well well and the cool thing about these too is if you've been following the market like we bought ours for 4700 dollars, mm -hmm. and those yeah. those days are long gone yeah i mean yeah. The, the two specifically i think are like the last of the old school land Rover brand mixed Correct. in with some of the new yeah. 
the new kind of comforts. So yeah. they're, they're getting, even a stock one without this is getting pretty expensive. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's really hard to find anything that has the style with solid front axles uh, that's customizable to it. That's why everyone I feel like is going towards the Land Cruisers, uh, uh, totally. you know, FJ80s, but uh, you know, those are really, really hard to find. And so I think that's driving up the price of these. So, uh, Alex, you want to open up that interior door over there? Um, Charles, talk to me what you did about the interior because, uh, first of all, it's in beautiful condition, but I'm most impressed that you still have the original selector for the transmission, yep. steering column's not butchered, the, the gauge cluster's all good. I mean, it looks like a factory vehicle in here. Yeah, yeah, I cheated a little bit there because uh, the leather seats are new. The <laughs> original ones were torn. I mean, it's 14 years of, of wear, what do you expect right. uh, on there? But apart from that, yeah, I tried my best like I said, to keep everything looking stock uh, in there. Obviously the head unit is aftermarket to get the you know car play and off-road maps on there. But apart from that, not too bad. The, as you know, the headliners are notorious for sagging. I, I was and it's, looking, it looks pretty good though. It's, it's on the edge. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it'll it eventually annoy me enough, but there's so many things to remove to get that headliner out. Uh, it'll probably stay there for a while. Okay, video for Alex, if you remember this. Nope, that's clipped in, and then this. Oh no, so that that's one clipped in too. That one is another fun thing about the RW Engineering Kit. Is this is actually tap up, tap down uh, transmission uh, oh, what? for it. So yeah, so going Super down the um, you know the passes out here, be able to shift it down a couple of gears rather than riding the brake. So you you don't need to use the, the three two one there. You can actually no. So it can it. three on this is now manual mode, oh. uh, if you will. So plop it into manual mode and then run the uh, tap up tap down through that little center yeah. gauge fit does the mode perfectly. button does the mode button do anything no, okay no, it doesn't do anything anymore that was sport mode or manual mode on it uh originally but doesn't have any function oh man it's so clean in here thank this you it's just beautiful so charles thanks for coming by yeah not a problem really appreciate it he's better at this than i am clearly <laughs> and he's way more skilled because he put this together um I, this is a really cool option i mean you really charles is being very modest but this is a very, very big undertaking. Like if you want to do this, um, it's not just, I think, for your typical person. Uh, but if you do have the skill or you want to pay someone who does have the skill, what you'll end up with is a vehicle that not only looks fantastic, but crazy good off-road and super long lived because those LSs for the most part are pretty good. So what are your plans with this? Is this going to be like a long-term thing? Are you going to hold on to it for a while? Oh yeah, I think I'm going to hold on to it for quite a while. It's my daily now but also uh you know heading out to steamboat this weekend already have plans for moab trips just the ability <laughs> to take it to all the mountain towns and get on any trail i want to get on for the most part Sweet. Uh, is going to be great that's awesome well big thank you to charles for uh for showing us his rig big thank you to you guys for uh tuning in and we'll see you guys on the next video maybe we'll get charles to uh come out to a trail with us i think that'd be a really fun thing